All right, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Oh, sorry, one moment. Sorry about that, everyone. We've had a couple of feedback issues with um, the audio today. I think we just need to make sure that the, the presenters and I all have uh, muted microphones when we're not speaking. So apologies for that. Hopefully we can avoid future uh, strange sounds in the rest of the program. OK, so um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This is, of course, the second in this eight-part series to complement your in-person training for the Texas Heritage Responders team. These programs are made possible through the generous grant funding support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We'll be holding our next session on fundraising after disasters on Wednesday, March 21st. I'll just pull this over here quickly as a reminder. Uh, please refer to this slide for all upcoming dates of programs. And uh, just a refresher, if you miss any of the sessions, I will email you following the program with a link to the webinar recording. Simply email me when you finish viewing the program, and then I'll mark that in your file. Before we begin the presentation, just a couple of quick technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side. You can use that chat box to say hello, ask questions, share any information or links that you'd like. If you post a question in the chat box, you'll receive a response from me. Uh, I will be collecting all questions and then verbally asking them of our presenters during a break in the presentation. Since we have two presenters today, they will each take questions following the end of their remarks. At the bottom of your screen is a box labeled Web Links. You can click on these to highlight them in blue, and then click the Browse To button in order to be taken directly to the site. That Salvage at a Glance guide will likely be familiar to you from your course handouts. All right, and with that, I'm very pleased to introduce you all to our wonderful presenters for today. Tara Kennedy and Al Barna. Tara Kennedy is a Preservation Services Librarian at Yale University Library. She holds an MLIS and a Certificate of Advanced Studies in Library and Archives Conservation from the University of Texas at Austin, an MS in Forensic Science from the University of New Haven, and a Bachelor's Degree in Art History from Northwestern University. Before her time at Yale, she worked at the National Archives, the Smithsonian, and the Gerald Ford Conservation Center. Tara is currently serving as co-chair of the AIC Health and Safety Committee. Outside of work, she is a theater critic for Onstage Blog and a volunteer for the DOE Network, the Online International Center for Unidentified and Missing Persons. Our second presenter is Al Barna. Al is Occupational Health and Safety Officer at the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco, which is the de Young and the Legion of Honor. His 20 plus years of experience at the Fine Arts Museums has enabled him to develop an award-winning museum safety program, recognized by the State of California's Division of Occupational Safety and Health, or Cal OSHA's Golden, State Golden Gate Award. Al is most proud of growing the safety and emergency response program for both museums under the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco umbrella, as his staff, his staff and footprint have doubled in size. Al also serves as the Museum Climate Liaison for the City and County of San Francisco's Departmental Climate Action Plan. Tara and Al are both members of the National Heritage Responders. Tara serves in the NHR Working Group, which helps to direct team activities and develop resources. While Al was deployed to New York City and served as the weekly team leader at the FAIC Cultural Recovery Center in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy in 2012. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Tara to start off today's presentation on health and safety after Thanks, Jess. Uh, coming to you live from snowy Connecticut, or at least it's starting to be snowy. Uh, probably not so snowy where you are. Uh, lucky you. <laughs> so let's get started. So why is health and safety so important? So protecting people is paramount. That's the number one thing I want to get across. Human life comes before collections. You can't save collections if you're not well. And if you just take five minutes to put on the proper personal protective equipment, you will save a lifetime in potential chronic and acute illnesses. It's required. There are OSHA requirements that exist for personal protective equipment, and there are a number of code of federal, there's a number of uh, codes of federal regulations as well. And frankly, I've noticed over the years that health and safety seems to be the last thing on everyone's mind when a disaster strikes. And if I'll take the next slide as an example, 
So I saw this image. Um, it's in the American Library Association magazine showing Reforma President Tess Tobin on the left and ALA President-elect Lloyd Garcia Fable visiting a hurricane-damaged library at the University of Puerto Rico. And basically, I freaked. If this, is, if this was used for a publicity shot in a magazine, it clearly demonstrates that people do not understand how to protect themselves properly with personal protective equipment. You don't hold on to your respirator at the bottom while the other strap is hanging down and the other one is just so ill-fitting, it's gigantic, it probably leaks all the way around the entire perimeter of the mask. I, I just saw that and instantly went, Ee! so um, so I thought it's really important to make sure that you use the equipment, not only use the equipment, but use it properly. So for the region that we're talking about today, um, the Houston area is what um, I focused on, even though it looks like a lot of you from our different, different regions in Texas. Um, so I focused on Houston. Houston resides in Harris County, which is a flat, low-lying region near the Gulf of Mexico. And its elevation is only 80 feet or 32 meters above sea level. So it's one of, one of its biggest risk factors, as you probably know, is flooding. Despite an extensive drainage system in the form of bayous and man-made drainage ditches, and this past August with Hurricane Harvey, that this image shows the amount of rainfall that fell in the early morning hours of August 30th, 2017. And to give some perspective on the numbers that you're seeing on your screen, the city of Houston received as much rainfall in several days during that time as it does on an annual basis normally. The average rainfall amount is around 50 inches, but was around 50 inches between 1981 and 2010. So Houston got walloped, essentially. Oops. And so one of the vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities of uh, that location there on the Gulf of Mexico is hurricanes. Um, and since the devastating Galveston hurricane of 1900, which is still considered the deadliest weather disaster in U.S. history, southeastern Texas has always been at risk for hurricanes and tropical storms due to its climate and location on the Gulf of Mexico. And so the images you're seeing are the paths of Hurricane Rita on your right and Hurricane Ike on your left. And as a side note, if you want to read a really interesting book about the Galveston hurricane of 1900, Eric Larson's book, Isaac Storm, is an excellent read, even if it is about weather. So one of the first things you're going to do is enact your emergency plan after a disaster. And if you don't have one, you need one. So what makes up a good response plan? Pardon me. So emergency response plans are considered an ever-changing, ever-improving document, and you always need to be updating it and keeping the staff trained in critical functions in case of an emergency. For some reason, the image that's supposed to be here is not coming up. So I apologize for that. There's supposed to be a cycle showing that, um, showing sort of the ever, uh, basically an emergency plan is a living, a response plan is a living document. So you will have a written plan. You need to have management support for such a plan. Staff training and drills, making sure people know what's in the plan is important. And you need to have feedback after you have said drills or even after emergencies so that you can have continuous improvement upon your response plan. So what are the elements of a response plan? At a bare minimum, the elements listed on this slide here should be included in your emergency response plan. And this is based on federal OSHA requirements. And in some cases, depending on the institution that you work for, they may have already incorporated these into their overall emergency operations plan. For example, I work at Yale, which is a giant university, and they have their own emergency operations plan and department. 
So if you have a larger university, a larger institution that you work for, a lot of this may already be in place for you. So what you're going to be focusing on is going to be collections and, of course, your own personal safety. So to give you an example of the elements of the library emergency response plan that we have, um, the first section we have is, well, we have uh, five sections to it, plus appendices that have various um, elements in it. Uh, emergency communication section, prevention and risk assessment, which is important. Emergency preparation, emergency recovery, and emergency response. So the emergency communications portion is the institutional level of communications um, are included in that if it's a large institution, like I mentioned, that has a large emergency management department. So you need to have those numbers. But if you don't have like something as if you don't work for someplace as large as a university, it could be something as your communications plan can be something as simple as a phone tree. Who calls whom during a particular emergency? Prevention and risk assessment, things like checklists for places to make sure that you prevent emergencies from, ha emergencies from happening, such as making sure your temperature and relative humidity set points for collection spaces are at a certain level, um, that you have an integrated pest management program, essentially steps of a preventative conservation program, essentially, is what that section is. Emergency preparation. That's training and education for staff who will respond to emergencies, creating collections, priority lists, and maps, and overview of areas of responsibility. So the teams you have, the roles that these people and teams play, and the overall responsibilities. The two main players we have in our plan are the facilities duty officer, which is essentially our buildings operations and security officer, and the preservation duty officer, which is the person in the preservation department who uh, carries what we call the emergency phone. So we have a 24-hour uh, hotline that anyone can call with a collections emergency. And the, well, actually now, I carry it um, all the time. So if anyone calls and I answer the phone and I help them sort out the uh, emergency and I become the preservation duty officer. So it means I will give out instructions to the other managers and anybody else on the team as to how to handle the situation. Emergency recovery. You can have lists of your emergency supplies available. One of the things I do have um, is this chart here, which I'm sorry, it's hard to read here. Um, but it sort of gives you a sense of how serious the emergency is and how you should respond. It's adapted from a table that's in the Stanford University's Library's Collection Emergency Response Manual. I thought it was a really good overview to sort of give you a gauge as to what, what how um, serious the emergency is. Um, so, and at the bottom, the other thing that I recommend is the, um, which I think you already have as a handout, as Jess mentioned, uh, Betty Walsh's Excellent Salvage at a Glance, which is the link, the first link at the bottom. And now, since I've yacked on about um, emergency plans, there's a poll that Jess has for y'all. Do you have an emergency plan and is ready for action? How many you got it? No cheating. <laughs> It looks like it's almost split down the middle. Okay. Oh, I can't see the whole thing. Just hoping for the best count as a plan. <laughs> well, yeah, sort of. But, uh, yeah, okay. So it's sort of all sort of looks like it's split in thirds. So, so for those of you who don't have emergency plans, um, it might be something that would be uh, something that might be on your list, your to-do list going forward. Tara, really quickly. Couple of quick emergency responses. <laughs> Sorry, a terrible, terrible uh, reverb there, and sorry to, to mute you for a moment, but um, the, the missing slide from earlier, um, sometimes 
this program does not like certain PowerPoint slides, I think especially animated ones. So this was um, what Tara was referencing in terms of the, the ongoing um, cycle of uh, the planning process. So I just wanted to share that with you all before we moved on to the next piece. So I'm going to go ahead and hide that and turn things back over to Tara. Sorry about that. Thanks, Jess. OK, so I'm going to talk just to briefly uh, go over, mention some emergency response and salvage tools. Um, on your left is a screenshot of the emergency response and salvage app, which is based off the item on the right, which is the emergency response and salvage wheel, and also the field guide to emergency response. Um, the items on the right are available through AIC. And the Emergency Response and Salvage app is available for the iPhone and Android operating systems for smartphones. Um, it's OK. It's better than nothing. So if you don't have an emergency plan in place and are hoping for the best, as our poll showed, having something like that on your smartphone is better than nothing. So at least you have some guidelines to follow. And it sounds like a lot of the tools you'll be getting through this particular program uh, such will also be helpful to you. And I'm going to make a pitch for a tool that I made. Um, so the second link at the bottom of your screen there that says Collections Prioritization Tool. Um, I created a simple Excel spreadsheet to help Yale with creating a prioritization list for their collections. So what you're seeing here is a map that's a result of the Collections Prioritization Tool. And this is an old map, so I'm not giving away any secrets. So. Um, if you go to that link and take a look, you can download the instructions and tool. It's a series of yes or no questions that you uh, ask your uh, the curator or librarian of, that's responsible for the collections. And it helps them to prioritize collections uh, without, with your kind of, I don't want to say, it's basically walking them through a series of questions. And by the time you do scoring at the end, you've created a priority list that is almost painless. I've had feedback from librarians who were very concerned about not being able to decide which is most important and which isn't, and was pleasantly surprised at the end of the process how easy it was. So I'm spreading the word and hoping that people can use this. Um, and if you have any feedback that you want to give me on it, I'm more than happy to, to take it. So feel free to play around with it and adapt it and make it your own. So first responders, this is these are your people, your go-to people who are going to show up first in an, in an emergency. So get to know your local firefighters and first responders. Like you can host an emotional, yeah, informational social event where they can learn about your collections and the value to the community. This is a huge boon. I know of a number of cultural properties that have done this kind of thing, and it's made a world of difference when there has been an emergency. Uh, the more familiar the responders are to your building and its contents, the more efficient their response will be. And it also will be uh, more respectful. And they'll sort they'll understand that you're not just um, you know an office building, that you have precious contents and they can't they, they may take better care and have a better understanding of what it is that the property is and its contents. And this is another important thing to have, off-site resources, public safety agencies, contractor lists, courier services, truck rentals, uh, conservation resources like regional centers, and art handling and shipping. Having that list um, include your regular vendors and service providers as well as emergency agencies on the federal, state, and city levels. Um, some people have county levels instead of city, depending. Uh, exclusive service or priority service contract agreements are highly recommended in these situations if you can do that. Um, we do have one for the library, and it's not necessarily a contract, but it's sort of an agreement that we are on a priority list um, with a disaster response company. And in situations where it's been, we've had overwhelming floods from pipe leak, pipe bursts and things like that, it's been extraordinarily helpful. Um, So we talk a little bit about risk and exposure for these air for um, during emergencies. So flooding and water damage, which I imagine most of you are probably fairly familiar with, 
Um, and flooding can be a result of hurricanes, tropical storms, excessive rain and earthquakes, or even melting snow, which will probably be the case for us here on the East Coast in, I don't know, by tomorrow morning. Uh, water damage can create hazardous le electrical conditions, silt deposits, mud, debris, and a toxic stew of raw sewage, fuel, and chemicals. Flooding and water damage can also contribute to hazardous electrical conditions, as I mentioned. In Houston with Hurricane Harvey, there was much concern about contaminated flood waters, and it was covered by um, a lot of media outlets, which I didn't notice so much as with Katrina, interestingly enough. So um, due to the number of petrochemical plants and refineries in the Houston area, benzene was a common contaminant found in the flood water, waters after Hurricane Harvey. Pesticides were another contaminant that were found in the flood waters due to exposure from the water with fields that use pesticides. Bacteria such as E. coli from sewage contamination, as well as heavy metals like lead and arsenic were found in standing water in one family's living room. And this was due to the fact that 40 of 1,219 area wastewater treatment plants were not in operation after the hurricane. The bacterial count is, was, is unusual, was unusually extremely high. So unlike the woman in the picture, <laughs> which you can see the, the space between her sleeve and her glove there, um, you should not have any bare skin exposed. That would be her forearms there. All open sores and wounds should be covered. All vaccinations should be up to date and wash your hands frequently if you're going to go into floodwaters or even place, even if you go into spaces where even if the floodwaters have receded, these uh, contaminants can still remain. So you have to take extra care um, with those sorts of situations. It's something I wanted to point out because I noticed that there was a lot of media coverage for it. And I think it's something that people don't think about um, as they're going into situations, especially after the flood waters have receded. Well, mold risk is certainly high, uh, high in these environments as well. We've got high humidity, high temperatures, and plenty of organic material for it to thrive on, paper, drywall, carpets, and even non-organic surfaces that happen to be dusty. That's organic. The dust is organic. So all molds, you have to think about that all molds do pose a health risk of some sort, and some people are more at risk than others. For some people, mold is a first a sensitizer, which then can become an allergen and then can later become toxic. So it varies from person to person. So it's best to make sure that you protect yourself as if it could be something that you would be severely, you would have a severe reaction to. And some molds are toxic to begin with, but only testing will tell. Stachybotrys, or that toxic black mold that the media tends to talk about, is one of the toxic variants and usually grows on construction materials. So if it's black, it doesn't necessarily mean it's stachybotrys. So, but you don't know unless you test. So assume that all mold is hazardous. And active mold versus inactive mold, something to mention. Active mold is in the early stages of a bloom has sort of hair-like filaments and webs, which develop into more like bushy appearance in, as the bloom matures. And it's easily seen under magnification. It's soft, it might smear when touched with a fine brush. It also could be slimy and damp. And in inactive mold is dry and powdery and will brush off materials readily. Just so folks know the difference. So fire produces smoke and smoke produces soot. Just as, and smoke um, and soot may contain I'm sorry, smoke might contain carbon monoxide, methane, vol uh, volatile organic uh, compounds, formaldehyde, benzene, acetic acid, formic acid, toluene, organic carbon, etc. There's a lot in fire and smoke. And smoke, smoke is uh, actually the result of incomplete combustion. Smoke releases carbon particulates into the air, and these particles are soot. And in the aftermath of a fire, soot will be deposited on surfaces within a fire damaged structure, like you see in the next slide here, like this. And some hazards associated with soot are respiratory and dermal mostly. Uh, so it's an irritant to lung tissue and to your skin. So you want to protect yourself from those as well.
For chemical spills and releases, as mentioned with the floodwaters, chemicals from plants, from petrochemical plants and that sort of thing, pesticides from farms, and even chemicals from facility facilities closets can cause problems. Environmental health and safety consultants should be brought in if there's a, a suspicion of chemicals in floodwaters or anywhere in the disaster area that you're working, because you want to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into and maybe exposing yourself to. So speaking of chemicals in closets, um, one thing that's really helpful for folks who do have chemicals in their spaces, especially conservation labs, uh, is proper identification of a chemical con and chemical container content. And this eliminates chemical accidents and expedites medical emergency treatment and also firefighting as well, especially if you have you, know, you have different cabinet cabinets for different types of chemicals. So basic parts of a global harmonization standard, GHS compliant labeling is essential. All right, that's the end of my spiel. So now it's Al's turn. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, well, I'll pick up where you left off, Tara. That was great. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Okay, we are going to talk now about personal protective equipment, which, of course, is the equipment you will be using to go in uh, for your salvage and recovery and remediation efforts uh, after a disaster. So what you're seeing here are uh, posters that were designed uh, during the uh, Depression era. Uh, these were created by artists who were working in the Works Progress Administration, which was a part of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal programs. So you can see that personal protective equipment is not a new concept. In fact, it goes back centuries. Uh, you can consider armor to be personal protective equipment. And before you don any personal protective equipment, regardless of what it's going to be, uh, you need to do a hazard assessment of the area you're going to be working in. You have to determine the severity of the situation and what type of hazards might be introduced when you're selecting your PPE. And uh, be aware that OSHA requires a written safety program in order to comply with a lot of safety standards, but also with personal protective equipment. You need to have a PPE program. And then for each of the areas that personal protective equipment addresses, you might also need a uh, program that addresses that in terms of how you do training and how you wear the equipment, how it's distributed. So things like hearing protection, respiratory protection, fall protection, bloodborne pathogens protection, uh, all of those uh, require written safety programs as well as your employer's responsibility to provide the personal protective equipment that you need. There are five general categories of PPE. Uh, they are basically your uh, head protection, eye protection, hand protection, foot protection, and respiratory protection. Uh, so we'll go into that uh, individually. We'll start with respiratory protection. The respiratory protection is more complicated than the other categories of, of PPE. You need to have certain components in your program and uh, in, in, in the way you actually manage your, your respiratory protection program. Uh, you have to consider uh, respiratory, respirator selection. Uh, there have to, it has to meet standards that you can find in the uh, OSHA standards. Uh, you need to know that it's uh, NIOSH certified and uh, that it's, uh, you need to know the specific hazards that uh, the permissible exposure levels are designed into the equipment. Uh, you need to know what the assigned protection factors are for the cartridges and the mask. And uh, you need to uh, be aware of when cartridges need to be replaced. You, uh, but the first thing is to have a medical evaluation. If you are deemed unfit or not healthy enough to wear a respirator, it can actually create more of a hazard for you. So getting a medical evaluation from a physician should be paramount to you. Another and Al, um, we have a couple of yes. poll questions here. Do you want to go ahead and do those? Oh, sure. Yes, sorry. Oh, no worries. 
Okay, so the first one here is just wondering if any of you have ever uh, worn a respirator when responding to an emergency event. Great, so it looks like it's um, about 50-50. A few more of you have worn one. That's great. And then the follow-up question to that, sorry, Al, <laughs> one, just a quick follow-up here. Um, have you been properly fit tested to wear a respirator? Great. Well, that's really helpful to see. So only about a third of you have had that fit testing. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, Al. Okay, interesting information. Uh, again, fit testing is extremely important because if you're wearing a respirator that doesn't fit properly, you're actually exposing yourself to more harm uh, because, you know, most chemicals will desensitize your senses. Uh, you, after a while, you won't smell it, you won't taste it, but you will be absorbing it. So uh, fit testing is extremely important, uh, and it should be done more than once a year. You should, you should try and do a qualitative or quantitative fit test every time you use your respirator. Uh, and you also have to be aware of how to use your respirator. Your program should include uh, information about checking the seals on the unit, uh, how to use it with other PPE, uh, being able to identify defective parts and how to replace them, and uh, you're, you should know about modifications to respirators and not approved replacement parts. You want to stay with the manufacturer's parts and you don't want to modify your respirator. I once saw a gentleman who uh, had cut a hole into his respirator so that he could smoke a cigarette while he was working. Uh, so that's not a good idea, obviously. Uh, you need to be aware of maintenance and care for respirators. You want to know how to clean and disinfect it, how to store it, uh, and repair methods that you might have to utilize if you've damaged it. As far as uh, storage, I know from personal experience that when OSHA comes in and does an inspection, they will open your cabinets and open your closets and drawers, and if they see a respirator that's not stored properly in a sealed bag with the cartridges sealed, uh, you will be cited for that and fined for it. So uh, having a respirator stashed away in a closet uh, with other uh, you know, hammers and tools uh, up against it or sitting on top of it, uh, you open yourself up for a violation because uh, the rest the cartridges are going to be absorbing any impurities in the air, particulates, whatever, vapors, chemicals, uh, if they're not sealed. Uh, what a lot of people do is cover the uh, cartridges with duct tape when they're not being used. But the most practical thing is to put it in a Ziploc bag. Okay, and uh, it's crucial that you have a training program and information available for people who wear your respirators. They need to know why a respirator is necessary, uh, they need to know about the compromising effectiveness of, of a respirator. If you've got a, a respiratory ailment or a heart condition, uh, you're putting more strain on your system. So you need to be aware of that as well. And that's where the medical uh, certification comes in. You need to know what the capabilities and limitations are of the type of respirator that you're wearing. Uh, you need, need to know how to store it. And uh, you basically should understand the general requirements of the respirator regulations that OSHA propagates. And uh, you also need to evaluate your program at least on an annual basis. Uh, you need to uh, look into alternatives to wearing a respirator because actually a respirator should always be your last choice uh, for PPE. If you can introduce mechanical controls, uh, engineering controls, uh, that should be your priority before you actually go to using a respirator. Uh, you want to make sure that your employees are involved in your respiratory protection program. Their input is really valuable to how successful your program is. And uh, based on all of that information, you may find yourself having to make adjustments to your program on an annual basis. Where I work at the Fine Arts Museums, we only wear half-mask uh, respirators, half-mask air purifying respirators. Uh, we don't get into scuba gear or anything more complicated than that. Uh, if we, if in a situation like that, we would bring in professionals to do the work. Uh, again, determine if mechanical engineering controls can be employed to eliminate the use of a respirator. For instance, uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, floor fans, or if you have an HVAC system, it can be adjusted for 100
100% fresh air intake and 100% stale air uh, removal, uh, that might uh, preclude the need to use a respirator. We'll talk about hand protection. This is a photograph actually from the uh, Conservation Recovery Center in Brooklyn back uh, after Hurricane Superstorm Sandy. Hand protection uh, is important. Um, it's governed by uh, ANSI standard uh, number 105-2016. The standard numbers aren't important unless you're jo you have a job like I do where you actually have to convince management that these things need to be done and that there's uh, consequences if they're not done. And excuse me. So there are a number of criteria for uh, selecting the proper uh, hand protection. Uh, there are many gloves designed for many different purposes. Uh, here you have a bullet list of uh, what you may be looking for in the type of glove that you need for whatever job you're going to be performing. You have mechanical protection, uh, protect your hands from moving parts and machinery, uh, chemical permeation and chemical degradation. Uh, Conservators will uh, be aware of that because that's what you, when you're using chemicals, you're handling them with the appropriate gloves. Uh, heat and flame protection is a factor that might be considered. Uh, how uh, abrasive, abrasion resistant a glove is. Uh, if you're working outdoors in a cold environment uh, or if you're working in a cold room, you might want to be pr protected from that risk and exposure. Cut resistance and puncture resistance uh, are important factors. Vibration reduction, if you're actually working uh, heavy machinery like a jackhammer or heavy-duty power tools. And another criteria is how much dexterity does the glove allow you? You wouldn't want to wear a glove uh, to carry an Etruscan bronze, for instance, which uh, would make it hard for you to grasp the object. So uh, dexterity is, is a, an important factor to consider when you're selecting uh, safety gloves. Oh, we have another head quick... protection, which essentially is... Another poll question. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, do you know about the AIC Health and Safety Committee's glove chart? <laughs> and uh, Tara, you might want to jump in here. I'm seeing pretty much all no's um, and explain a little bit about this resource. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you, one person. Um, so, uh, the Health and Safety Committee on the AIC Wiki website has created a chart um, that tells you which gloves you should be using depending on the chemical that you're using. So it's specifically for conservators. So I, if, you're, if you're not a conservator, I can sort of understand why you haven't heard of it. Um, but it still could be applicable to just stuff you're doing at home because um, not all gloves are created equal. So apparently we need to do a better job of advertising that. So that is good information to have. Thank you. OK, and uh, along those lines, there are charts available for just about every category of uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, you can find these uh, through your vendors or through vendor catalogs. Or uh, OSHA puts out a great series of fact sheets for just about any safety concern that you might have. So you can go to the OSHA website and look for those as well. Uh, now we're talking about head protection, which essentially is hard hats uh, most of the time. And OSHA actually has two standards that govern hard hat requirements. And you don't have to concern yourself with those right now. But both standards require that workers wear hard hats when there is a potential for head injury from impacts, falling or flying objects, or electrical shock. Uh, that means that your employer must provide a hard hat that ensures that the Employees wear protective coverings in falling situations. When objects or debris might fall from above and strike workers on the head, when employees may strike their heads against fixed objects like supports, beams, or other equipment, and where there is a possibility that workers' heads will make contact with electrical hazards. It's very important. Uh, so wearing a hard hat doesn't make you invincible. You still have to uh, use your judgment and uh, use your safety skills uh, when, when you're wearing a hard hat, uh, as well as with all PPE doesn't make you invincible to injury or accidents. Uh, and with head protection, there are a number of things that uh, are required on the protection itself so that you, you can purchase a hard hat and knowing you bought the, the appropriate uh, 
type of hard hat for your job. Uh, each um, helmet, each hard hat is going to have the following information, the bullet points should point out there. The manufacturer's name, the uh, standard that the hat conforms with, and the type and class designation of the helmet, uh, what size range it will fit, and the date it was manufactured. This is the underbill of a hard hat, and uh, the red circle tells you where you can find that information. Uh, it's usually on the under, underbill of the hat, or it could be on a label inside of the hat. And uh, the F F FAIC National Heritage Responders Group are provided with a hard hat as part of their standard protective equipment. Uh, this happens to be my helmet. I'm sorry, I keep saying helmet and hard hat, but essentially I, it's the same thing. And then you have foot protection, uh, and I think this is very important. Uh, I often hear uh, in, in our circle, people like to talk about boots on the ground, and I often wonder how many of those people actually own a pair of boots. So uh, foot protection is something to consider after any emergency, any disaster situation, because you're going to have risk and exposures, uh, glass, mud, electrical hazards. So when you... Uh, Purchase footwear. There again, there's important information on the label, and uh, you want to know what this, what, what all of this means. So on the label here, of course, you have the men's. It's a men's shoe. It tells you what size it is, brand, and the materials. But in the rectangle in the box is where the important information is. The uh, ASTM uh, number there tells you that the uh, it's. This, this boot is approved by the American section for, of the International Association for Testing Materials. And uh, line one uh, tells you that it meets the performance requirements of that standard. Line two tells you that it is designed either for an M, uh, it signifies male. If it was an F, obviously it would be female. And uh, it also identifies the existence of the impact resistance of that boot. In this case, the impact resistance is 75 pounds. And the compression uh, resistance is uh, signified where you see the C slash 75. It's also rated at, 70, at 75 pounds, which actually correlates to about 2,500 pounds of compression. So you're buying a very high quality piece of footwear. And uh, there's also the MT, which you don't see on this shoe. Uh, there'd be another line that would be the uh, metatarsal designation and rating uh, for the shoe. Okay, so again, uh, this is usually found on the, on the inside of the tongue of the shoe. It could be on the uh, collar around the ankle part of the shoe. But uh, you don't want to purchase a pair of uh, work boots, steel-toed work boots, if they do not have the uh, ASTM uh, approval. Hearing protection uh, is not always primary to uh, a lot of emergency response or recovery, but if it is needed, uh, again, there's a, a number of criteria for wearing hearing protection. First of all, it, uh, OSHA standard does not kick in until the decibel level exceeds 85 dBA. If it does, you again need a written safety program as well as providing the uh, employees with the hearing protection. And the uh, hearing, the written hearing protection program is pretty extensive. You have to have a section that uh, outlines the purpose of the program. You have to have a section that uh, describe, uh, uh, lists the policy of the institution. Uh, you need to uh, discuss the scope of the program. You have to include a summary of all of the regulatory requirements for hearing protection. You have to have methods of monitoring employee no noise exposure. Those are, you know, again, engineering controls or mechanical controls. Uh, you might have to bring an industrial hygienist to do that for you. Uh, you have to have a section on how you control noise exposures. All of your employees should have an audio metric testing performed before they actually wear uh, hearing protection. You have to do a training program. You also have to maintain records. Record keeping is very big with OSHA. You need to have records of all of your uh, programs and, and the people, your employees or staff that are involved in any of your safety programs. You need training records, you need uh, medical records, uh, and you have to hang on to those for quite a while. Some of them as many as 30 years, those records need to be available for OSHA's perusal. 
Uh, you also have to talk, discuss and come up with a method of how you calibrate the hearing equipment that you are using. And there are some appendices to that whole program. Uh, care and maintenance of protective devices. Uh, you need to have a hearing loss prevention certification for each employee. Uh, you need to uh, also create a certification checklist so that uh, you know that you are actually complying with uh, the OSHA standard. So it's not as simple as just putting on a pair of earplugs. There's a few, th a few things uh, involved with it. It can be a little complicated. But basically, uh, the, he the hearing protection standard is designed to address continuous, intermittent, and impulse noise. Uh, it also uh, will give you a formula for determining the permissible exposure levels and the time-weighted averages for the amount of noise and the level of decibels over a certain a period of time. And all of that is factored in by a pretty standard uh, charts and calculations done by industrial hygienists. We have eye protection as another concern. Uh, you need uh, eye protection for different purposes. Uh, you, and you have to select the appropriate protection. Uh, chemical resistance, uh, if, you, if you're working in chemicals where you have a potential for splash or spills, uh, making eye contact, you want to make sure that the, the eye protection you're wearing is chemically resistant. You might have to uh, consider impact versus non-impact uh, glassware or eyewear. If you're working in construction, you pretty much need impact resistant eyewear. Uh, laboratory work, uh, maybe not as much. And if you're working with lasers, uh, other uh, light generating equipment, you would have to consider optical radiation protection as well. So let's go back to this slide. And based on what we've been discussing, uh, I'm wondering if any of you see anything wrong with this photograph. It's not a poll question. I'll quickly tell you that no, uh, this gentleman is really suited up uh, perfectly for what he's doing. Uh, he's got head protection. He's got eye protection, ear protection. You might not be able to see all of this in the slide. And he's also got uh, fall protection. You see his harness. And hopefully that's something uh, you won't have to be engaged in it during your careers. Uh, it's a whole nother specialized area of uh, fall protection uh, and personal protective equipment. So anyway, and he's also wearing, you'll notice he's wearing a Tyvek suit. Uh, this comes in really handy if you're working in a dusty environment or an environment where uh, you uh, may be exposed to asbestos. Hopefully that's not the case uh, if you have asbestos uh, problems in your building, they should be identified in advance. You should have an asbestos, an asbestos abatement program in place and an asbestos management program in place. And you need to be certified by your state government to, uh, to basically run those programs. We'll talk about some of the immediate hazards that you might encounter where you're actually going to need PPE. Uh, since glass, uh, this is a photograph of a glass pyramid in the courtyard of museum, one of, the, of our Legion of Honor Museum. Uh, this uh, is taken from below in the galleries that are on the, on the basement level of the museum. So for me, I know that I don't want to be in an area where we have uh, an, an abundance or a lot of glass in an earthquake situation. So uh, something you can think, think these things out in advance, just like you should know at least two exits out of any building or any location in a building that you're in. These are things you can do to protect yourself prior to a natural disaster. Because glass in most emergency or natural disaster situations will end up being broken glass. Uh, so therein lies a hazard. And uh, broken glass is obviously can result in cuts and lacerations. So if you are responding to a situation where you have glass, you're going to need to wear boots and the proper gloves. And another thing to consider is when you clean glass, if you've been in you know, a flood or an earthquake, there's always the potential for uh, gas leaks, a natural gas leak. So you might consider uh, getting a, a selection of uh, spark-proof tools uh, because in a, in a gas leak situation, if you're using a shovel and a broom to, to sweep up broken glass, that spark can trigger an explosion, a natural gas explosion. So just something to consider. They're not, uh, they're not cheap, but they are very effective. In earthquakes and storms, uh, you know, hurricanes, high winds, uh, you will likely experience falling objects. Uh, this is in one of our art storage areas. Uh, you can see that uh, these clocks are secured 
to a uh, framework uh, which is also secured to the structural parts of the building and uh, our uh, shelving units are you should always make sure your shelving units are secured to the walls or at the very least to the floor if you can't do a wall secure uh, situation and uh, we keep all of our materials containerized and in padded uh, containers and we also strap them in uh, I recommend using nylon straps and, and uh, snap uh, uh, kind of buckles as opposed to bungee cords because bungee cords can be really dangerous they're a, a real eye hazard uh, seen had a number of close calls over the years with uh, bungee cords snapping back or failing and uh, hitting people and, uh, and uh, you don't you don't want to lose an eye so uh, bungee cords are not the safest thing to use when you're securing your your materials or your objects you want to make yourself familiar with the utility shutoff locations in the buildings where you work uh, this is usually a responsibility of your building engineer but if the building engineer is not available you want to know you want to designate other people to know where and how to shut off your utilities this is a floor plan that I made for one of our facilities uh, we have our, our water shut off the gas shut off and the electrical shut off and uh, G is also is a, designates our emergency generator system and a utility site plan is also very helpful uh, not only for your your staff but for the fire department if, if they have this information uh, in their system for instance San Francisco has a hazardous materials unit that's part of the fire department and all of our hazardous materials inventories our floor plans our location of hazardous materials storage areas all of that is in a computerized system that the hazmat uh, staff has and they actually have that information on board their vehicles so if they respond to an emergency at our facilities they know where all of these utilities are located they know where our hazardous materials are stored. It makes their job a lot easier. They can uh, uh, perform a much more effective uh, operation. So uh, you, you want on your site plan, which is a perimeter plan, to, you want to make uh, sure that you have your sewer lines and your storm drains marked, uh, all of your fire hydrants and any of the out exterior shut uh, We have one last plan. poll question here, uh, very quickly, and um, related to those last couple of slides. Specifically, wanted to know if you knew where the water main shutoff is for the primary building that you work in. Okay, no one's feeling too confident about the answer to this. Okay, one person knows for sure, um, but it looks like we're about 50-50 for having a sense of where it might be, but also uh, half the group doesn't really know where to even start. So um, helpful information to have. Thanks, everyone. And that's the last poll question. OK, so uh, when we're done here, you might want to go and talk to your facilities people and ask them where your utility shutoffs are located, uh, because you might be the only one in the building some afternoon. Uh, hopefully, that won't be the case, but at least you'll know how to shut things down. And uh, we'll just talk about shutting off gas. Most things like the electric, obviously, is a switch. But the gas shutoff uh, is confusing for a lot of people. And all you have to remember is that when you find the gas shutoff valve, uh, if the pipe, if the valve is in line with the, with the length of the pipe, it means the gas is open. When you turn that valve across the pipe, you have shut the gas. You've effectively shut the gas off. Uh, all of your water lines should be labeled. And this is code in most uh, municipalities but you want to know your domestic water lines your hot and cold water lines all of this is really helpful not only for your staff but also for emergency responders uh, you be aware of electrical hazards so they can be in, in this is a boiler room but electrical hazards created particularly in, in uh, flood situations water uh, earthquake situations you have uh, obviously you have seismic activity uh, electric lines can be damaged so you need to be aware of uh, electrical hazards. They can tend, if you've got a short or if a wiring's been damaged, you can smell it. You have a, the smell of burnt ins insulation, or you might see and hear sparking. So those are very important uh, issues to consider. And uh, walking in wet water can be very dangerous around electrical equipment. So you want to make sure the people who are are doing these assessments after after a, a 
disaster are trained to be able to do it appropriately and not injure themselves. And not all electrical hazards again, will be as uh, simple as uh, this one, uh, where you see the switch and the plug uh, hanging out of the, the junction box. So uh, this was also at the Cultural Recovery Center. And, and when I was sent or dispatched to the center, I wasn't quite sure how useful I would be because I am not a conservator. But fortunately for me, uh, there were the building was donated to AIC, and uh, it hadn't been used in many years for, for more than storage. So I was able to go around and take care of things like this. So uh, all of our volunteers who came in made it a safer experience for them by taking care of electrical hazards and uh, light bulbs in the exit signs that had burned out 30 years prior. We were able to take care of all of those things. And uh, you know, my, my intention was to make it a safe work environment for all of our volunteers. And the last thing we'll talk about is heat illness prevention. And this occurred to me when we were actually watching news footage of the flooding in Houston and the, the storm damage in Miami the, you know, a few months ago. And I realized that most of the salvage and recovery work is probably going to have to be done outdoors, outside of the building. And so I thought I would incorporate some basic ideas about heat illness prevention. So there are a number of disorders related to heat illness, and there are three primary uh, disorders that you should be aware of. Uh, the most the, the uh, minor, the most minor is heat cramps. Uh, and here you, I have a list, a column of symptoms and a column of first aid. And you'll notice as we go through that the first aid is pretty similar for uh, all of these uh, uh, conditions, but they get a little more extensive uh, the more serious the condition is. So heat cramps uh, are a good indicator that uh, you might, you may be dehydrating, that you've been in too much sun or heat. You should, your body is giving you a message that you need to do something about it, uh, which essentially is hydration and shade. Heat exhaustion is uh, an early stage. Heat exhaustion is an early indicator that the body's cooling system is becoming overwhelmed. Uh, the symptoms uh, are, are pretty obvious, and the first aid uh, is, is also pretty obvious if you're using common sense. You want to get the person out of the heat, out of the sun, uh, provide them with hydration, Cool them down, ice packs, uh, cold water, uh, you know, get the person wet, and get them to an emergency room if the symptoms don't improve within 60 minutes. Heat stroke is the is late stage uh, heat illness, and it occurs when the body system is actually overwhelmed by heat and they stop functioning, so your organs start to shut down. And because of that, heat stroke is is a very serious life threatening condition. So uh, you will notice that uh, your you or your coworkers will uh, become confused, uh, the possibility that you'll faint, uh, sweating, and uh, dry skin. I know that sounds like a, a, a contradiction, but uh, it can manifest itself either way. And this is a situation where you would want to call 911 immediately because this is a life-threatening condition. And uh, the rest of the uh, first aid fall, is in line with the, the two other conditions we, we talked about. And uh, the way to prevent this is through uh, hydration. You want to have plenty of fluids. And that means water is ideal. Uh, coffee and alcohol uh, are not should never be considered. That's you don't want to drink a cold beer on a hot day while you're working. And uh, acclimatization, which means if you have the option, which quite often we don't in a disaster situation, the, the more time a person works outdoors, obviously the, the easier it is for them to acclimatize to heat. But we don't always have that option. So that's where training comes in handy, employee training. And also, you should always employ a buddy system. Uh, people should never work on their own when they're outdoors in, in high heat situations uh, because you need someone to keep an eye on you. So you keep an eye on each other. So like a lot of emergency response, you never go into a building alone uh, after a, a flood or a fire. You, you make sure you have someone else with you so that you have some accountability. And with that, uh, that wraps up my portion of the presentation. And if you have any questions or if you ever need any information, I'm more than happy uh, to make myself available. But that's my uh, email address on this slide. So feel free to contact me at any time. I would love to talk to you about any questions or problems that you might have. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention. Uh, great audience. <laughs> See Great. You, well, thank you so much, Al, and thank you. Um, thank you to both of our presenters, Al and
Tara today. Um, as you see with this final slide here, they were generous enough to share their contact information, so thank you both for that. Um, we did have one question come in. Uh, Al, Jesse was wondering, um, with the, one of your last slides, to say not to administer fluids for heat stroke, or did he read that wrong? I think I know the answer to that, but. Do not administer fluids. That's correct. At that stage, it, it, it's, it's like a lot of medical emergencies. You, by giving somebody fluids, you may be uh, prolonging the response time or the fact, you know, you, you don't want to give somebody fluids who, who's going to need to go under anesthesia or need surgery. It's the same with, uh, with, with, with heat stroke. Uh, if you let the emergency responders and medical personnel determine if fluids are, are necessary. But you, you want to drink fluids in those earlier stages and leading up to a potential medical uh, emergency. But once you've got to that point of no return where your body's shutting you down, you don't want to introduce fluids. Did anyone have any other questions related to anything Tara discussed or anything that Al discussed? Obviously, this is a very big topic, um, one that we, we touched on um, with a couple of presentations during your in-person sessions as well, um, and certainly something that I would encourage you all to continue to explore throughout the course of this training over the next few months. Um, lots of great resources. Uh, so Jennifer's wondering if there's a suggested website or source of information to convince administrators of the need for health and safety plan. Do either of you have suggestions for good go-to resources on that? It's a great question. Uh, Tara, I would you... think that any of the federal or state uh, OSHA regulations, wouldn't you say, Al? I mean, that's pretty hefty stuff. I mean, it's yes. yes, and all of that information is available. And you can also, OSHA has a consultation service, which is really valuable. They'll come in and do an assessment of your entire building if you want them to. And uh, they won't cite you for any violations they find. They'll give you an amount of time to uh, rectify or remediate the violations. And it's, you know, a, a lot of management people, they hear OSHA or they hear the fire department, they don't want to hear any more about it. But the, those people are actually your friend and they have resources. And if you work with them in a good faith, uh, as a good faith gesture, it's appreciated and they will help you. Uh, and uh, as far as keeping your management people out of jail, that, that's, a, that's another good ploy. Uh, I always tell the my boss that I keep him and uh, the director of the museum out of jail because if <laughs> if you uh, don't have these programs in place and if you're in violation of, of the rules, it's considered negligence. And in the event of an employee death, uh, fatality, or a serious injury where you've lost a limb, uh, you're going to have an, a full OSHA investigation and they will go wall to wall basically and find everything uh, that is not up to code. And it, it can and occasionally does result in jail time for the responsible people. So uh, if you can press on upper management that it is in fact the law to have these things in place, uh, so much the better. So, yeah, nothing like jail time to uh, put the fear of God in your upper level administration. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, thank you, Al, for that reminder, too, that, um, you know, a lot of these guys that are considered to be scary can be our friends, you know, calling in the, the professionals who can check and make sure that we're um, up to code on, on any number of things. It might be a scary undertaking, but it's, it's worth doing. Um, so Christiana had a question for Tara. Um, she found on COOL, which is Conservation Online, for those of you who aren't aware. Uh, she found two articles from December 2000 and October 2003 about treatment of mold in libraries. Uh, the case study they used was the Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma libraries, and they successfully used chlorine dioxide in powder form, uh, hanging in sachets in the storage area. And it was available commercially as uh, Aspetrol and Centrex, but it's been 
discontinued. Do you know anything about this, Tara? Is that familiar to you? Tara, is that familiar to you? Uh, it's not. Um, I would... I, I, I can't even begin to hazard a guess as to this, so I probably won't. So I'm not familiar with this treatment methodology, and um, if it's been discontinued, <laughs> there might have been a reason why. Um, I would have been interested to, re I'd be in I'll go make sure to go look that up, actually, because I would be interested to see who actually conducted this particular uh, treatment, if it was actually under the direction of conservators or not. Um, and that was some time ago. So, I mean, granted, it's still in the early 2000s, but um, I know there are still places that would do are doing are doing some sort of, I guess you can consider rogue uh, mold treatments that would not necessarily be the safest uh, recommendations. So it would be something I'd have to read and be familiarize myself with because I'm not familiar with it. It was supposed to be safe for people because chlorine dioxide is used in drinkable water. Hmm. I'm so afraid I can't comment because I don't actually know. Do you know anything about this, Al, about this chemical? Uh, no, I do not. I know we do not have it in our inventories. Yeah. Um, that's something that maybe we can, you know, uh, look into and, and see what we can find. But thank you for raising the question. Um, oh, great. Yes. Yeah, so if you can email the links to the articles, that might be helpful. Let's take a look at that. Hey, does anyone have any other questions about the content covered today? Uh, seeing no one typing, uh, I want to just go ahead and take this opportunity to, to thank everyone who joined us for the live session today. I hope you all found it to be useful. And of course, a big thank you to our two presenters, Al Barna and Tara Kendi. Um, you both are coming at this topic from um, slightly different positions. And I, I think both of those perspectives are so valuable in this discussion. And I want to remind you all to please go ahead and take the um, a survey about this particular webinar. It would just take a couple of minutes, as you recall from the last one. Um, so again, just use this link box the way you do with any other. Uh, click on the text and click the Browse To button, and that should take you to a uh, SurveyMonkey link. So um, thank you all. And a reminder that our next webinar is going to be coming up in a few short weeks on the topic of fundraising after disasters. <laughs>